Уважаемые участники семинара, разрешите начать семинар. Первое слово, вступительное слово предоставляется Нариману Манапекову, директору представительства АБР в Казахстане. Большое спасибо. Дорогие мистер Канад Сириуров, депутаты Черманов Забортов, Казах Национальный Аграрий Университет, мистер Кайрат Мутаев, депутат директор за департамент по продаже и процессингу лайсток продукт в Министерстве агрокультуры, коллеги и друзья из АДБ. On behalf of Asian Development Bank, I am honored to welcome you the scientists, academicians, young researchers, central and local government officials participating in this workshop on assessing rangelands for sustainability and carrying capacity. As you may know, EDB provides continuous support to the government of Kazakhstan, including in agriculture sector. This workshop is an important output of the joint government and Kazakhstan, government of Kazakhstan in ADB's knowledge and experience exchange program. And we are pleased that this uh, joint initiative with the Ministry of Agriculture and Kazakh National Agrarian University. In, a, uh, in an arid zone environment, it is easy to damage pasture quality to the determinant of the environment and livestock productivity. Rangeland recovery can take time, and achieving recovery requires supporting policies to be in place so that farmers and graziers can implement the appropriate management practices. The specialists we have from Michigan State University and the U.S. Department of Agriculture are leaders in the field, and they have put together a very interesting program with a lot of practical guidance based on two years of work in Akmala region. I would like to take the opportunity to thank Mr. Jaco Q and Mark Wills, and also the entire team of consultants and counterparts at Kazakhstan Agrarian University for the solid work they have put to make this lecture series possible. I trust it will help us all with addressing the challenges ahead to improve Kazakh livestock productivity. I wish you an inspiring and successful training. I hope it will also serve as a good platform for learning and networking. With this, I am glad to pass the floor to Mr. Kanat Tiriur, Deputy Chairman of Kazakh National Agrarian University. Over to you, Mr. Tiriur. Thank you. Спасибо большое, господин Манапеков. Разрешите следующее вступительное слово предоставить Канату Маратовичу Тлеву, заместителю председателя правления правосту Казахского национального аграрного университета. Уважаемые коллеги, разрешите мне приветствовать от имени нашего председателя правления ректора Тлекеса Сабаевича Исполова. Тлекеса Сабаевич находится в Акимате на совещании, поэтому разрешите поздравить и выступить от его имени. Уважаемые коллеги, я рад приветствовать всех участников семинара и в особенности его организаторов Наримана Манаппекова, директора представительства АБР в Казахстане, Мутаева Хайрата Мендебаевича, заместителя директора департамента производства и переработки животноводческой продукции Министерства сельского хозяйства, Марк Вельц, представитель Министерства сельского хозяйства США. Господина Джигуа Чи, профессор университета штата Мичиган. Уважаемые коллеги, уважаемые участники семинара, 
проблема эффективного использования сельскохозяйственных угодий в Казахстане является самой актуальной. За последние сто лет деградации подвергли 48 миллионов гектар земель. 38% из них – это пастбищные угодья. Устойчивым управлением этих ресурсов препятствуют два фактора. Вокруг населенных пунктов места для выпаса скота подвержены деградации из-за чрезмерной нагрузки и вытаптывания. Удаленные пастбища недоступны из-за отсутствия там источников воды и инфраструктуры, дороги, мосты, жилье, средства связи и другие. Помимо этого, заброшенные отдаленные пастбища зарастают агрессивными сорняками с низким содержанием питательных веществ, что оказывает негативное влияние на биообразие. По расчетам ученых-аграрников, при рациональном использовании пастбищных угодий можно было бы довести по голове животных в стране до 30 миллионов условных голов. Текущая нагрузка – 12 миллионов условных голов. Для рационального и эффективного использования пастбищных угодий необходимо совершенствовать знания сельских предпринимателей в сфере устойчивого управления ими. Необходимость обеспечения эффективного использования пастбищами в Казахстане также неразрывно связана с развитием семейных фермерских хозяйств, что особенно актуально в связи с объявлением ООН десятилетием семейских, семейных фермерских хозяйств 2019-2029 годы. Поэтому данный семинар, проводимый в рамках международных проектов, позволит решить актуальные вопросы сохранения, восстановления, внедрения эффективных подходов и агротехнологий для сохранения пастбищ. Актуальность данного семинара заключается в изучении методики оценки повышения продуктивности пастбищ, восстановления деградированных площадей, расчет допустимого поголовья животных в зависимости от размера пастбищ. Казахский национальный аграрный исследовательский университет реализует международные научные проекты с Азиатским банком развития, университетом штата Мичиган, службой сельскохозяйственных исследований Министерства сельского хозяйства США. Это оценка ресурсного потенциала отрасли животноводства в Акмолинской области. И второй проект – это взаимозависимая динамика продуктов питания – энергии и воды в Казахстане и Монголии. По результатам проведенных исследований разработаны карты, где приведены данные максимальной и минимальной температуры. Количество осадков, состояние pH почвы и размещение сельскохозяйственных культур в области за период с 1980 по 2019 годы. Установлено, что за последние 40 лет в данном регионе наблюдается снижение продуктивности пастбищ на 58%. Проведены измерения чистой первичной продукции пастбищ, которая является важным для выявления антропогенного воздействия на экосистему. По результатам непрерывного дистанционного измерения первичной продукции с помощью современной спутниковой системы МОДИС составлены карты распределения биомассы, количество испаренной влаги, а также определены самые продуктивные экосистемы в Акмолинском области. Также в сотрудничестве с нашими партнерами реализованы такие крупные проекты по развитию сельского хозяйства в Казахстане. Это создание Казахстанского центра знаний по интегрированному управлению водными ресурсами, это оценка цепочки добавленной стоимости в животноводстве и другие проекты. Уважаемые коллеги, я уверен, что на протяжении всего семинара все участники получат ответы на интересующиеся вопросы по управлению пастбищными угодьями. Желаю всем участникам семинара успехов в работе. Спасибо.
Спасибо, Ханат Маратович. А следующее слово предоставляется Мутаеву Хайрату Миндыбаевичу, заместителю директора департамента производства и переработки животноводческой продукции Министерства сельского хозяйства. Здравствуйте, уважаемые участники. Позвольте мне поприветствовать вас и выразить признательность за заинтересованность в сотрудничестве с нами и за проделанную на сегодняшний день работу по оценке ресурсной базы для развития производственной технологической цепочки производства мяса на базе Акмолинского региона в рамках совместной программы обмена знаниями и опытами. Учитывая, с одной стороны, потенциал отрасли животноводства Республики Казахстан, а также поставленные перед правительством задачи по созданию к 2027 году 500 тысяч новых рабочих мест, повышение доходов в сельских районах, а также производительность, повышение производительности труда. С другой стороны, необходимо учитывать ограничения в части отсутствия достоверных научных данных о почвенно-растительном покрове пастбищных угодий, о доступности водных ресурсов, а также кормовом потенциале пастбищ. Хотелось бы отметить важность реализации данного проекта, который направлен на комплексную оценку, оценку потенциала пастбищных земель. Данный обучающий семинар по оценке пастбищных угодий на предмет устойчивости и пропускной способности является важной частью проекта, который предоставляет возможность изучения мировых научных подходов в отношении инструментов оценки устойчивости пастбищных угодий и методов расчета пастбищной нагрузки. В свою очередь, я уверен в том, что результаты по итогам реализации данного проекта, в частности, научные находки на базе актуальных данных, помогут выявить и в дальнейшем решить актуальные проблемы в отрасли животноводства, а также может послужить моделью для осуществления подобных исследований в других регионах страны. Ну, в завершение <coughs> позвольте пожелать плодотворной и результати результативной работы. Со стороны министерства мы готовы оказать необходимое содействие в достижении полной реализации данного проекта. Спасибо. Спасибо большое. Хотела бы представить наших лекторов, которые будут вести тренинг. Это Марк Велц, Министерство сельского хозяйства США, а также Джиаго Чи, Университет штата Мичиган. Сегодня тема нашего семинара – это количество, количественные методы оценки состояния и тенденции в области производства и устойчивости пастбищных угодий в масштабе пастбищ. То есть будет вести Марк Велц. Марк. Uh, thank you very much. I'm quite honored uh, to be here uh, this morning here in the United States and in your early evening over there in Kazakhstan to start this uh, training series. We have our US-based team uh, with our Kazakhstan partners at Koznow uh, have developed a five-part training uh, program. Today, we're gonna start with qualitative methods uh, for assessing rangelands. So they are quick uh, and easy approaches then to determine if you need further analysis to look at the productivity and health of your rangelands. So that is today. Uh, the presentation is hopefully uh, useful for you guys. It has English on the left-hand side and a Russian translation on the right-hand side for most of the slides. Where we have worksheets, those were in English because the handbook, which is free, I will provide that to Koznow and Golnaz, uh, then you can download that. Uh, U.S. Department of Interior joint publication with USDA. Uh, it's a nice PDF version of what I'm talking today. It's all in English. So the slides that show those worksheets 
are in English because they are directly taken from the handbook. So today we're going to talk about qualitative methods. It's kind of the first thing we do when we go out to a new property to assess the status. Next week, uh, same time, we'll talk about quantitative measures to actually physically measure it so you have defensible scientific answers of the current status of your property. And that just gets to the two of the ecosystem. What is its current function and what is its current capabilities? In the third lecture series, uh, we will actually talk about how you calculate stocking rate. Uh, we are primarily based on beef livestock, but the approach will show you how to adapt it for mixed grazing for things like we saw a lot of herds on ranches that might have uh, dominated by beef cattle, but they could also have horses and sheep. When we had the opportunity to travel in Southern Kazakhstan, we saw herds of camel and there are also goats. So the approaches we are presenting here will work for all of those livestock species. The examples we're gonna use are based on beef because that was a request from the Ministry of Agriculture and ADB to look at increasing uh, or look, excuse me, what are the opportunities for increasing livestock production focused on the beef industry. These same approaches also could be used then for looking at grazing dairy cattle. The fourth presentation then is going to be on scaling up answers. Uh, we're using the Oblast Akmola as an example but all of the approaches we are working on today work globally, no matter where you are on arid and semi-arid rangelands. We have colleagues listening today from Jordan. Uh, they work with ICARTA and we have worked with them for several years. Uh, and these approaches work over there as well as they'll work in Kazakhstan and they are the standard approaches that are used in the United States by the US government agencies, such as the Natural Resources Conservation Service and the, and the Bureau of Land Management. The last presentation then will kind of summarize all of it. Uh, we'll show you the current model uh, that we are using for looking at rangelands sustainability and how to quantify benefits from conservation. Uh, that our acronym for that model is REM. It stands for the Rangeland Hydrology and Erosion Model. And so that's kind of our seminar series over the next five weeks. Uh, each Wednesday uh, at the same time, uh, either I or Dr. Chi will be making presentations. Uh, I may be the speaker uh, presenting this, but there is an entire team uh, that's been behind us. And we want to thank ADB and especially Hans for their support, uh, especially during these challenging times of COVID. Uh, we have Jason Nesbitt on my team here in Reno, Nevada in the United States. We have Dr. Ken Spaeth with the Natural Resources Conservation Service. Jay Guachi is our program leader out of Michigan State. Uh, Golnaz uh, from Cosnow and Mira from Cosnow have absolutely been essential to getting this project operational and moving to CIS-4. Uh, we thank uh, the rector, Dr. Yespolov, for all of his support going back to 2016 to get us to this point. So that's my introduction and we'll go ahead and get started now. Uh, if you have a question and you want clarification, uh, please unmute yourself and ask. Uh, I only speak English, but we do have translators uh, who do speak fluent Russian. And so you can ask your question in Russian or English and I will try and answer it. So don't hesitate if there's a question uh, and you need an answer please ask and I'll stop and address it. Uh, it doesn't help if you don't understand something. So please don't hesitate, ask an appropriate question. Uh, and with that, then I'll start screen sharing and we'll move through the presentation. All right, well, thank you. We're gonna to start today's uh, in this five-part lecture series with the qualitative approach 
for estimating rangeland health. It's a series of indicators and attributes that are added together in a qualitative scale from one to five. And it allows us to then determine if that property is in good ecological condition or if it has some challenges. We don't make management recommendations based on this technique. This is an informative technique that then tells us we need additional research or additional discovery, or if we can go ahead and continue with existing management because everything looks appropriate. All of this work is documented in the handout or the handbook. It's called Interpreting Indicators of Rangeland Health. It was just updated late last year in August 2020. We have been using this approach for approximately 20 years and refining it here in the United States. At the end of this uh, today, I will provide Golnaz and Cosnow, our partners, the PDF for this, and we can make it available for all of you to download for free. All of the training material, all of the models that we'll be discussing are free to the public to be used, to be copied in any way you would like. I didn't share the screen. Uh, Golnez, can you see my screen? Am I sharing it appropriately? No, you can't. Oh, I got to hit the button down there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So let's go back to this one. Sure. Oh, there you go. Can you see the presentation? Oh, go ahead. Not to the presentation, but the screen, your screen, okay. computer screen. There you go. Am I sharing the first slide now? Yes. Okay, I apologize. Uh, giving Zoom training is new to me, and so uh, hopefully we will go smoothly from now on. Uh, as I was saying, on the left-hand side of the screen uh, is interpreting indicators of rangeland health. It is uh, a nice document. It has all the worksheets in it and steps you through it with examples. Uh, and I've used that as the basis for our presentation today. As I've gone through this presentation, you'll see we try and use uh, pictures from Kazakhstan across the country that we can document then uh, conditions in Kazakhstan and make them really relevant for you. Occasionally, I've used photos from the United States because I didn't have an appropriate picture for Kazakhstan. So moving forward now actually to the technique, what are the attributes, characteristics, and indicators of a healthy ecosystem? This slide represents a flow chart of the process of using this qualitative approach, what we call indicators of rangeland health. The first thing that we do here in the United States is we use a process called an ecological site description that has been developed. And that defines the plant community that exists uh, or should exist in concert with the soil. They, they evolve together. So we have mapped the soil and then we go out there and we have estimated what the plant community uh, species diversity is, its density, its productivity is. And that is our reference condition. So we start with that. If we don't have that, then we have to go make it. And I'll, we'll step through all of that. So the first thing we do then before we go and visit a ranch for an assessment is to collect all known information on that area. As one of our earlier speakers talked about today, you wanna to get your soils map, you wanna get your land condition, uh, land use map, uh, that could be a satellite imagery, could be a uh, polygon map where somebody has uh, drawn it in GIS. You want to get a list of species uh, that should be relevant out there, uh, both natural species and introduced species. You want to get your uh, precipitation data available. 
historically. You also want to, uh, if possible, access current weather for that year up to the time that you're coming. So are you in a drought? Are you in a wet period? Have you had an extremely cold winter? Uh, has it been excessively hot? All of those in information help us then to understand what we see on the site. The other piece of information that you wanna get if possible is what has been the current history of that property? Has it been historically grazed? If so, by what livestock species? What time of year they grazed? How many animals were grazed? Uh, so you can kind of understand when you get out there, what have been the drivers to allow that plant community uh, to express itself today that you're seeing. So we're gonna talk about indicators and attributes of rangeland health today and how we use those. An indicator is defined as the elements of an ecosystem used to assess the process that are too difficult or too expensive to measure. So due to the complexity of ecological processes, a suite of indicators are recommended. No single indicator is used to determine the health of an ecosystem. We have selected 17 indicators uh, that we qualitatively assess. We aggregate them into three different attributes. These are just two examples. I'm by, traditionally a rangeland hydrologist who deal a lot with soil erosion processes on rangelands and how to correct that. So a lot of my examples are gonna be drawn from my experience as are these two indicators, the amount of bare ground, and then your hydrologic flow patterns going across the landscape. There are 17 indicators that we utilize. On this first slide, we show the first nine. They are our rills, water flow patterns, pedestals and terracets, bare ground, gullies, wind scoured areas that have been blown out uh, by wind erosion, litter movement, resistance to erosion. That is a term of soil structural cohesion, loss of soil structure, plant and infiltration effects. Do you have compaction layers in your soil? Functional structural groups of plants, plant mortality, decadence, reproductive potential, litter amount, your annual production, above ground annual production, the amount of invasive plants, those can be native plants that are invasive as well as exotic introduced plants that are invasive. We also address noxious weeds. Uh, that's a specific term that we use in the United States. And I'll go over that in more detail later and the reproductive capacity and capability. So those are our 17 indicators. We group them then into clusters or what we call attributes. So we have three attributes then that we ultimately end up rating. So the first group is one that deals with soil and site stability. There are techniques that you can actually quantitatively measure if you want more detailed information than the visual approach that we're gonna talk about today. And those are listed over here on the right in our chart, line point intercept, canopy gap, soil stability tests. And in our second lecture, we'll actually go through these physical measurement techniques and how we use them. The second group of attributes is called hydrologic function. Those are consistent of the indicators that go into that group are water flow patterns, bare ground, soil surface resistance to erosion, soil surface loss and degradation, plant community effects, litter cover and depth and distribution. And then we have biotic integrity that deals with the plants. We're gonna go through all of it now in detail and systematically work through each 
of the uh, indicators. In the United States, specifically in the southwestern parts of the United States, uh, there is a life form type that we call cryptobiotic crust uh, or soil crust, microphytic crust. It goes by many names. Uh, and it is an example then uh, that we will use in those plant communities where it exists. It is a very slow growing uh, organism that's on the soil surface, as you can see in the pictures, but it is highly susceptible to damage from uh, livestock trampling. And so it's a good indicator uh, in those environments where it dominates. Our first indicator we're gonna go through are rills. Those are small erosion rivulets that are generally linear and do not necessarily follow the microtopography. They generally will go straight up and down the hill slope. Uh, they may be deflected slightly to the left or to the right if they hit an obstruction like a large plant that is deeply rooted or a rock. Uh, as you can see in this picture, uh, so what we're looking at are these rills. What is the length of them? How wide are they? How deep are they? How dense are they? And this is all relative to our reference condition. This individual picture I'm showing right now uh, is a hill slope uh, just south of my uh, home here in Reno, Nevada. Uh, it was taken two months after a wildfire. That's why these trees were all bare. Then we had a large frontal storm come in, uh, drop two inches of rainfall and cause all of this catastrophic erosion because no plants had had a chance to uh, reestablish. So this site now is, and you go downstream from the hill slope, the channel bottom, uh, we had debris flows and mud flows this site is permanently altered now as far as its productivity uh, because of this one large erosion event that happened to fall a catastrophic wildfire. We have lost productivity here. Rills can be natural features on the landscape. They are not always an indicator of degradation. There are many places across the globe where you have marine shale derived landforms in arid climate. They tend to be saline and some of them are sodic or saline and sodic. These two pictures indicate natural geologic formations that are highly erosive and that is their natural state. They have extremely low productivity and little value from a livestock production capability. But it doesn't mean that we have caused degradation. This is their natural state. One of the interesting aspects of these landforms is this is natural, but they could still have undesirable consequences downstream so when we have large rainstorms in this part of the southwestern United States, these areas actively erode, and then we get large flushes of sediment then into our river courses, uh, which then causes problems with aggregation in the stream systems and may result in flooding. So even though it's a natural process, it still can have undesirable consequences. Second indicator is water flow patterns. And that's the path that water takes as it accumulates and moves across the surface in, in overland flow processes. The picture on the right-hand side actually is from the body in Jordan. And I've indicated with the dashed lines how the water is moving downhill. The two large shrub clusters, they're kind of in the center of the picture, were able to deflect the water. It moved around it and then it concentrated in between the two lower shrubs. And so this is an indication in this format, you can see the lag gravel or the rocks that are showing right there in the channels, in these micro channels. This is an indication of degradation processes that has been initiated. 
On the left-hand side, uh, that's an Artemisia plant community. And you can see the water line I've tried to outline with the black uh, dashed line showing how that water is moving through and around the shrubs through the ecosystem. Pedestals and turrets. Those are signs of degradation. As you can see in the top picture, there is an elevation of that grass crown above the normal soil surface now. That's been through erosion, a combination of wind and water erosion. That is a sign of degradation. That is different than natural processes that can occur and we should see in Kazakhstan, and that is frost heaving where during the winter months from snow and or snow melt, water infiltrates into the soil. It then freezes. That ice in the soil lifts up the soil and you end up with this mottled kind of speckled soil surface in your bare areas. I'm trying to indicate that in the last slide at the bottom. That is a natural process. It makes the soil fluffy. It can remove compaction layers. And you need to be able to differentiate the, the difference between that frost heaving soils where it occurs and then these pedestals because uh, they can be confusing. The next thing we're looking for on the hill slopes in this pedestals are the terracettes. As you can see in the left-hand slide, again, this is a picture from Jordan. You can see the natural process of these litter debris dams that were formed as the water was moving down the hill slope. Uh, the picture on the right gives you an indication then again of a debris dam uh, that's forming a linear, linear uh, feature across the hill slope. These are really readily identifiable as degradation is occurring. You're moving litter across the soil surface. In both of these examples, these are water-based movements. We have some slides later that'll show you what wind movement uh, can do to uh, surface organic matter and litter. In both cases, it's a ready sign of degradation. These terracettes can also be caused uh, and quite often are the direct result of excessive livestock grazing. Livestock, we try and manage livestock so that they don't get counted as far as grazable land on slopes that are above 30%. Uh, when you get above 30%, the livestock do not go straight up and down the hill. They often will zigzag across the hill in what we kind of commonly call here catwalks or the zigzag terraces. In both of these photos, they are a clear indication of excessive historic overgrazing. That's the only way you get this land form. Bare ground, it's a natural feature uh, of many of our ecosystems. As bare ground expands, you get connectivity uh, of these bare ground patches that accelerates the ability for erosion to occur, either from wind and water. Uh, in Akmola, in your historic grasslands there, bare ground is very rare. Uh, the Artemisia, Stipa, Festuca plant communities we have seen there that are in very good condition, bare ground is essentially non-existent. So if you start seeing bare ground at all, it's an indicator of degradation. As you get large patches, you definitely have uh, serious degradation. And we'll show you some direct slides uh, from Kazakhstan that'll document that process. Gullies, those are when a, a rill transforms in, into a deeper, wider, connected uh, water channel that is actively eroding both in depth and width, we call those gullies. Uh, these are uh, different photos of erosion events here in the United States. Occasionally, again, in these unique environments uh, that we do see in arid and semi-arid areas, gullies will form through natural processes in these marine drive geologic formations, uh, and they're just natural. Uh, but they are fairly easily identifiable. If you look at these uh, photos, they're from Badlands National Monument. 
uh, National Park in the United States and South Dakota, it is clear that these are naturally forming processes and not due to overgrazing by livestock. Wind scour, blowout areas, wind erosion. Uh, wind erosion is gonna be more of an issue in Kazakhstan as you go south and you get more into the desert environments where you have open areas. In Akmola, we did see some indications of wind erosion where the areas had been seriously overgrazed. And so what we're looking at are these scour areas on the right. And then classic uh, identification of it is on the left where you see <laughs> sediments that have piled up and is starting to bury the That's vegetation. Do we have a question? Uh, litter movement, as I said, uh, one on the left is from water distribution. You can see that uh, debris dam on the right hand side. You can see the litter has been pushed up into that shrub community, which acts as a uh, windbreak. And those are both classic indicators of degradation. Soil surface resistance to erosion. This one actually uh, is qualitative, but, but we physically pick up a small ped off the soil surface. We dunk it in deionized water and you look at how rapidly it falls apart and disperses. Very well cohesive soil will take a long time to disperse. If the soil is very weak in its structure because it's lost organic matter, then it will fall apart right away. And so this indicator is very challenging to use uh, because you physically have to go to your reference area and do this test so that you have a direct comparison when you're on your site that you're evaluating. There is a companion to that resistance test, uh, and that is getting a texture of soil. Now, USDA has defined uh, what we call soil and a whole series of ways of classifying soil. That is different than what the Russians uh, have utilized, and it's also slightly different than what the FAO use as far as defining soil. Uh, so if we're going to use this approach in uh, Kazakhstan, we can definitely adapt it to whatever soil sampling design is appropriate for the country. What I'm using today is based on the USDA's definition of soil. And soil is primary mineral particles that are smaller than two millimeters. Then we classify that based on the amount of sand, silt, and clay, three different class sizes of these primary minerals into 12 soil textures. It goes from sand on one end, clay being the smallest particles on the top, and silts being the intermediate sized particles on the right. You can take a handful of this soil that has been sieved through a two millimeter sieve, slightly wet it up, and then force it through your fingers trying to create a ribbon. And that will allow you with training then to get very accurate estimates of the surface soil texture. And that's very important because surface texture gives us a lot of information then potentially about how fast water can infiltrate into it. When you're doing that test, it, you can also see if there are calcium carbonate formations uh, indicating uh, certain properties. You can look for organic matter content uh, and that'll give us other inferences. There is a spreadsheet, uh, kind of a flow chart on the left showing you how you go through it. There are actually test kits that have been developed uh, that have all 12 of these textures in them. Uh, they've been laboratory classified uh, and you can practice them. And people can get very, very accurate this way. It is a quick way to do it and we highly recommend it. 
This then is, this chart also goes through hand texturing of soils and gives you modifiers. So if you have a lot of rock in your surface horizon, then we break that rock into different size fractions and use those as model modifiers. So we might say it's gravelly sandy loam or cobbly sandy loam. We also want to look at the structure, how that soil is adhering to each other. So what does it look like when you dig this small soil pit? Uh, is the soil all individual loose grains that you might see in a sand? Is it a silt clay type soil that is massive? It is continuous, is unconsolidated. You don't see any peds or any grains. It is laid down almost like concrete. They can also be, ex when dry, extremely uh, resistant then to pressure. So you can't break them with your finger. You need a hammer to break these things. There are other forms then of this aggregation, uh, subangular blocky, angular blocky. Uh, and in our handbook, it goes through more details and it has uh, more pictures on how to define that. All of this uh, helps us understand that soil and is it moved from a nice subangular blockly loose soil in our reference area and now because of overgrazing, uh, compaction from trampling from livestock is moved into a massive soil. Those are very clear indicators if it moves in that direction as I described of degradation. So we dig a very small pit down about 50 centimeters and we look at the soil. And what we're looking for is the horizons in the soil uh, and how they are differentiated from our reference condi condition. In this slide in the center, we show kind of in the left where the A horizon that, and again, I'm using all USDA's definition for soils, it's been lost from wind erosion. It's blown over to the right-hand side and stacked up underneath that shrub. So there we have a buried A horizon. Absolutely unequivocal definition of erosion. We have lost soil. It has moved from the left side to the right side. Plant community composition relative to infiltration and runoff. So if you look on the slide on the left, uh, that's from Akmola, very he healthy grassland, nice mixture of stipa and festuca uh, grasses, a few forbs, and a little bit of wormwood or the artemisia. If you look on the right-hand side, uh, you can see that that plant community is totally altered. We now have a lot of bare ground. It is dominated by uh, the wormwood, that small artemisia. Uh, and this is, uh, you can see in the background, it's close to water. Uh, has been seriously overgrazed. So you want to look for compaction uh, in the soil surface. Uh, this can occur if a livestock grazing area when it's wet uh, reduces the uh, resistance of the soil to, uh, to movement. And so the weight of the animal then over time can uh, compact it. That'll have deleterious impacts through reducing infiltration rates and can make the soil more droughty, and therefore then you have less production. Functional and structural groups. Uh, we break uh, plants into different life form groups. We'll have shrubs, we'll have half shrubs, we'll have trees. You have your perennial bunch grasses. You might have sod grasses, annual grasses, forbs, or as I indicated earlier, these biological soil crusts. So on the left-hand side is our more desired plant community. It's a mixture of perennial grasses and artemisia. On the right-hand side, you start to see a deviation from that where it's more artemisia dominated with festuca. The, the grass plants are farther apart and the size of the base is smaller. Those are all indicators this area is degraded. Plant mortality and decadence. 
on the left-hand side, you can see in the back, those two trees uh, have died. In the front, you see a decadent and dead grass. Very obvious, they're gray. They've been dead for a while. They've started to photo decay. On the right-hand side, you see a decadent shrub where it has died back and only a few branches are left alive. These are all indication that something is going wrong and the site is degraded. Could be from a long-term drought uh, in this case because we're losing trees, uh, but it's an indicator of stress in the ecosystem. Litter or mountain distribution, we've talked a lot about that. You can see on the right, on the left-hand side is our reference state. In the center, there's hardly any litter at all. It's all blown away or it's never produced because there's low productivity in our grasses. Uh, you can also get way too much litter. Uh, on the right-hand side, we found an area that had been historically not grazed for approximately a decade. And the thatch or that litter had built up on the soil surface that actually can reduce the annual growth of the grass and actually minimize its freezing capabilities. That's very easily corrected, potentially with a prescribed fire or active grazing management, uh, but you can have too much litter. Annual production, uh, what is growing out there, how much, and what type of plants. Uh, it requires training to estimate. We use five classes in 20% increments, zero to 20, 21 to 40, on up to 100%. We use what we call a double technique using weight units. So we will visually estimate like a handful of grass, clip it, weigh it, and let's say this particular example in my hand weighed 10 grams. Then you'd use your fist that you were holding that grass in and you'd go through your plot and estimate how many handfuls of grass you have in the plot. Multiply that by your weight unit and that gives you an estimate of standing biomass. You can also use volumetric measurements when you're dealing with shrubs. You can define a volume, whether it is a circle or a cone or a cube or a rectangle of certain length, width, height measurements, clip that, weigh it, and then you would estimate how many of those volume units that shrub had to get your estimate. The other thing that we do is when you're measuring a plot, you have to define what you're physically measuring in your plot. There are two approaches. Either one is, is acceptable. You just have to write down on your form which approach you use. So if you come back five years later, you know how you did it so you can replicate it. So there's the all-in approach on the left. Only plant material that is contained directly within your plot going vertical up is estimated. As you can see on the left-hand side, that branch went out and then came back in. We only count the plant material that's vertically totally contained within the plot. That's approach one. Approach two is if it's rooted in the plot, you count it no matter where you find it. So you can see in the circle that that plant actually had a branch that went outside of our plot frame, but we count it because it's rooted in the plot. If you look up on top, you see that that plant now is actually rooted outside of the plot, but it grew and hung into the plot. We discount that, don't count it, because it's not rooted in. Either approach is valid. You just need to choose one and stick with it. Invasive plants. Here in the United States, the picture on the left indicates an entire hill slope that has been taken over by an exotic invasive annual grass. We call it cheat grass. Its Latin name is Bromus tectorum. It comes from Eurasia. It's not a problem in your part of the world. We have seen it there, but we've never seen it take over an entire ecosystem and dominate it. These are highly fire prone sites 
and are causing us tremendous amount of problems here and is the leading causes of degradation here in the area that I live in and work in. You can have invasive plants that are native. Uh, Artemisia plants can expand. Uh, we've seen that uh, in Kazakhstan uh, due to uh, overgrazing and they can then reduce forage quality for certain types of livestock. You also have another class of plants that we really want to worry about. Those are noxious plants or poisonous plants. This one right here that I've seen on the right is what we call leafy spurge. It has been introduced into our northern uh, states here in the United States. Uh, it does have some toxic properties uh, to livestock, uh, specifically cows, but it's really noxious we use the term noxious then because it reduces productivity, overtakes the site, and we've actually introduced laws then to address its transport across county or state lines and treatment. So noxious weeds in the United States have a legal definition and you have to do something about them if found on your property. This leafy spurge actually is native to your country and we have seen it there and it can expand and greatly reduce your productivity. So it's something, if you see it, it's a red flag and you immediately want to look at, at why it's there and what can be done with it. It is an extremely difficult plant to remove once established. So you want to get rid of it as fast as possible. Reproductive capacity of the perennial plants. On the left, you see healthy plants that are flowering, uh, seed heads on the grasses, all indication is they're going to be able to produce offspring. On the right hand side, you see a shrub that's been significantly overgrazed. We would call it hedging. Its reproductive capability is highly diminished. Again, a classic uh, visualization of significant overgrazing. In this case, it actually was from uh, wildlife uh, that had concentrated in the area, so they can do damage just as well as domestic livestock. So now we aggregate them up into the three different uh, categories, soil and site stability, hydrologic function, and integrity of the biotic material. So attributes of soil site stability. It's the capacity of the area to limit redistribution and loss of soil resources, including nutrients and organic matter. One on the left, very good grassland. One on the right, it is degraded, loss of function. Indicators of soil site stability are highlighted in yellow. I'm not gonna read them all uh, and take that time, but uh, it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 different indicators that we put together in that package. Attributes of hydrologic function, that's the capacity of the area to capture, store, and safely release and transfer uh, water across the soil surface and into the soil from rainfall and or snow melt. Good plant distribution can capture snow, hold it on site, and allows you to have maximum productivity. Grasses have reduced ability to capture snow. Now, this happens to be an example from uh, Reno, Nevada showing the left-hand side is the natural plant community shrub dominated with grass interspace. On the right-hand side, uh, it is burned over, uh, that kind of fuzzy stuff uh, low to the ground. That's the cheek grass that has come in and the snow blows off these sites. And so you end up causing a drought type condition because that snow is blown off site. Indicators of hydrologic function. Uh, there are one, two, three. There are 10 different uh, indicators that we collect of, uh, together and then aggregate for hydrologic function. Biotic integrity then, the last of the attributes is really the capacity of the area to have functional plant communities. On the left-hand side, this is from the United States, a cold desert grassland. On the right-hand side, it's burned off, uh, really reduced and diminished integrity right now. 
Uh, these are the indicators then that we aggregate together to go into bio biotic integrity. How we utilize all this information then, our foundation in the United States is what we call an ecological site. It is a concept there where up here at number one, that is the historic plant community. So we would define that plant community as far as species mixtures, the type of soil, we'd classify the soil, and we look at the abundance, the distribution, the productivity of that plant community and describe it. Then when stress is applied to that ecosystem, it alters it. And what we normally see then is a change in species diversity, density, and productivity. So for Kazakhstan, we put together this prototypic ecological site description uh, to help us understand productivity <laughs> and its response to uh, grazing. So as you move from one to two, uh, going across Roman numeral two, you start to see plant decadence and excess litter. This was that one site that had been fenced off and not grazed for a very long time. We actually saw a change in plant community structure from just having it locked up. If you move from one to three, that can easily be changed and move back to a more healthy, more productive grassland by using appropriate grazing management or prescribed fire, maybe even haying it uh, and removing all that material or allow sun to get to the soil surface and start to break down that thatch layer. If we move from one to three, and you go from that stipe of diverse perennial grasses and shrubs, you start to then go into a festuca stipe artemisia. All of the plants are still there in the species. We're just starting to see a shift where stipe is more desirable forage for, for livestock grazing from cattle. And now you start to see festuca becoming a little bit more dominant because the cattle don't prefer it. Then as you move from three to four, moving to the right, what I call the degraded state, you start to see a larger expression of festuca, the artemisia becomes co-dominant and you started to have lost the stipa out of it. And some of our forbs are gone. If you continue to overgraze and stress that system, you move into number five, that severely degraded state. We saw several examples of that where essentially the only plant out there that was still alive when we were there in August of 2019 was that Artemisia. We could find almost no residual grass, whether annual or perennial. Only a few forbs existed heavily overgrazed. Ecosystem class or state four and five have started to cross an ecological threshold. If we just walk away from them, they will not automatically restore themselves in, in a rational time frame back to number one, as far as the state. It, it's going to take an intervention by us to then help drive that back to the desired grassland state. So what are the appropriate rangeland restoration techniques to do that? I don't know right now. Uh, we have not investigated that. Uh, in all likelihood, we have seen that great, uh, using reseeding techniques with crested wheatgrass, Agropyrum desitorum, Agropyrum cristatum, will be successful. We've seen that in a number of cases in Akmola and other areas of Kazakhstan, they have successfully uh, interceded with these native plants to your area and have highly productive pastures. Are there other approaches? I'm not sure at this point. It would take more work and I believe there are experts within Kazakhstan and Kaznau and other universities that could probably contribute to that. So we've gone through the basics uh, now we're going to start to use it. First thing, again, is develop our reference sheet. The indicators of rangeland health is kind of a five-step process. So first you define where you're going to drive to. 
And then you look up and get your soil and ecological site information. As I described earlier, you want to know what soils you're on, what are the expected plant communities, what is your biological list of plants, uh, what is the precipitation zone, your climate zone, that helps you understand it. You develop that reference sheet. So you go to an area that has been expressing itself in the condition you want. It could be a historic plant community, could be an altered plant community, but that's what you want to evaluate against. You like that state. You then develop your reference sheet. Then you go out onto your site in step four and you basically evaluate that site using five uh, criteria for each attribute. And we'll go through that next. And then we aggregate that for a final result. So here's the start then of the reference sheets. These will all be in English because they are exactly out of the handbook. So you have 17 indicators as listed on this sheet. Up at the top, then you have kind of standard information. Who collected the information? What is the date? And then we have some acronyms up there that are relevant to the United States. MLRA is a land classification unit, stands for major land resource area. And then we would name the ecological site. What is the plant community name? So then now here are your, you, we're starting to get the 12 indicators and they're the checklist then. So when you're indicating, you want to look at rills, how, how many are there? What is their length and width? What's the association on sleep? How steep is the soil? What is the slope? How are the bare areas? Are they large? Are they connected? Uh, what is the distribution uh, of them? And so these are all guides and remembrances so that when you're actually doing that visual check, uh, you wanna compare each of these criteria. Uh, this is number 13 through 17. Again, these are your individual indicators. So now you start to get to the actual reference worksheet. You're generating that. So you would go through here from one to 17 and you would start to write notes. There are no rills or rills are very intermittent and rare. And you write your notes down on here so that when you go to your site of evaluation, you can compare back to these references uh, and have a visualization. I, I would highly recommend you take photos of your reference area because if it's a month or two since you've been there, you may forget what that site actually looked like. This is your evaluation matrix then. So for each indicator, you score it one to five. So there are classes. So class five, none to slight. That's what you want to see. That means it's identical to the reference area. If you go on the left-hand side, it, it's, it would be class one extreme to total. It is totally different than the reference area. In this case for rills, there are numerous rills all across the hill slope. They are deep, they are wide, they are connecting, they have an indication that they may actually form into gullies. And so it's a qualitative assessment. Do you think it's identical to the reference area? Do you think it is highly you know, changed, that would be a five. The ones in the middle then are gradations. And with practice, each individual then will develop their own way of separating them. That's why this is a qualitative test and why we don't make definitive management decisions afterwards, because there is difference between each rater. And we go through great lengths. We have a five day training course here in the United States for people before they go out and use this to try and get them calibrated so that we can narrow that individual bias that occurs. So the next series of slides then will go through and describe for each one of these indicators then in words, how you would determine whether it is in class one, 
or in class five. Five being very, very dis, uh, close to the reference area. One being highly uh, disturbed. So we go through that then again. Uh, number 15 is one for annual production where we actually kind of use a quantitative measure. So we are breaking production down into five classes in 20% increments. So your annual production is a, is a minimum 80% of the, of the potential reference area to 100%. That gets that class five. If it essentially has no relationship to the uh, reference area, very low production because it's been severely overgrazed, uh, lack of plants, maybe even a fire has occurred, so there are no plants, that gets that class one, less than 20% production. So, I talked about this earlier that things are rated then by their functional structural groups. So we have these different classes of plants. So we have our shrubs being on the left, going to the biological soil crusts. Uh, these mo those are lichens, mosses, uh, bacteria. I have seen those in uh, Kazakhstan, in Akmola, uh, when we were doing our training and our evaluation in 2019. We did find small patches of mosses. I was quite interested to see that. Uh, you can also get uh, the equivalent of seaweed. Uh, there are blue-green algaes and red algaes that will grow on rangelands. Uh, they, they are most prominent following a rainstorm event. You'll see them. Gelatinous, kind of this weird, uh, squishy material. So when you're comparing these sites, you want to look at are these functional groups the same in the reference area as on the area you're in. As you saw some earlier pictures, we actually changed functional groups there in our ecological site description. We went from a plant community that was dominated by perennial grasses in the idealized state to uh, one that was dominated by that low suffertescent shrub Artemisia. So we had a total change, not only in production and species, and in life form, indicating a severe change. So here's the actual uh, structural workshop, uh, uh, excuse me, form that we utilize. Uh, and so we go through and get a lot of site information then. Uh, we wanna know the elevation. So you wanna be comparing sites that are at roughly the same elevation. They should be the same aspect. They should have the same slope. The soils, the parent material of the soil should all be the same. You should be in a similar precipitation zone because what you wanna do is compare apples to apples and not have an apple to like a cucumber. So that's why we take this different information and we should collect this all before we get on the site. And then you start going through your rating on the right hand side. So you have rills, and then you give it a number. Are you giving it none to slight, slight to moderate, moderate, moderate to extreme, extreme to total? Or you can use one, two, three, four, five. And you would then write down for each one of these what is its individual rating in those five classes on each of the 17 indicators. Here is some verbalization then that we put together for defining the reference sheet. So as we described earlier, this is the background information you want to try and get. And a lot of it does exist. And we heard an earlier speaker today talk about the 40 year hi historical record that has been collected for Kazakhstan, uh, both within the country and there's international information that's available also on FAO on soils distributions. Uh, there are maps then of uh, above ground net primary productivity. Uh, there are land classifications then based on uh, cover types that have been developed. There's a beautiful textbook of the Atlas of Kazakhstan that we saw 
a wonderful graphical representation of historical information on uh, the natural resources within Kazakhstan that we've looked at. Uh, you wanna accumulate all of that. This is looking at precipitation distribution. You wanna identify that ecological reference area. What are you comparing it to? Maybe it's a, it's a park where there's no grazing. Maybe it's just exceptionally well-managed rangelands. Maybe it's areas that have been excluded for livestock grazing on a research ranch. You need to identify that reference area. Here is your evaluation matrix then. So for each site, you go through reels. You can write all your notes down here on each of the 17 indicators. So we're gonna go through this now. So we're gonna use rills because again, remember I said I'm a rangeland hydrologist, so I focus on erosion. So I'm most comfortable in this environment. So what are the number and extent of rills? And I wrote a definition here. So for my reference area, they are minimal on slopes less than 5% and increasing slightly on slopes up to 15%. Rills were spaced 15 to 50 feet apart uh, that's English units because that's what our Natural Resources Conservation Service use. Over here, they still use English, unfortunately. So after wildfires, uh, they can uh, accelerate. Rills may double or triple even in numbers as you increase in slopes after uh, wildfire and high intensity storms. So I've written down my notes so that when I'm in the field, then uh, I have justification for my rating. We've gone through here then, these are our classes. Uh, I've tried to qualitatively uh, describe the number of rills, how many they are, how long they are, how dense they are. So again, I have justification for my writing. Here's a picture I took on a site uh, with this one classic rill that came off of the hillside and then went down. This kind of structure, uh, the photo doesn't show it, but about every 20 meters across that hill slope is replicated with a very strong linear function of rills. This site was an unraveling. Uh, it should have been a shrub dominated community. It had had a wildfire across it and it has this invasive annual grass, cheatgrass, Bromus tectorum on it. It has very low resistance to uh, water erosion. It's a annual that only lasts about six weeks and then it dies. So it has a very weak uh, root structure. And so when you get heavy thunderstorms, it can erode. And once this thing starts like this, it's only gonna end up in a gully. On rangelands, these features very rarely ever heal themselves. So that's kind of the generalized approach. I'm gonna go through an example now uh, that Dr. Ken Spath, Jess, Jason Nesbitt on our team uh, in 2018, along with Golnaz uh, and others from Cosnow, uh, were practicing rangeland health in Kazakhstan. Uh, to see if these approach would transfer. So we went to a particular ranch, we were invited on it. We collected our background information. Land use was beef, cattle, livestock, grazing, and horses and sheep. So they had all three types of grazing animals on it. We noted on the site that it had an invasive plant, Russian thistle. It's an annual uh, and it is undesirable and it has some toxic properties. We'll go over that later. There were some other uh, invasive plants on the site too, we noted. Slope was relatively flat, zero to 2%. Slope shape was uniform. Slope length was about 90 meters to 100 meters. Annual precipitation from our records that we could gather was about 150 to 200 millimeters. That's our background information that we needed to get started. So we found no grass species on the site. 
Wormwood was present, which is that Artemisia, and invasive plants. Shrubs dominated. They were about 49% of the plant cover. Litter cover was 46%. So that's actually pretty good. Bare ground was 54%. That is not good. That is too high a bare ground for this area. Site biomass was about standing biomass uh, was almost 2,000 kilograms per hectare, but it was almost all woody biomass and made up of invasive annuals. And neither one of those are highly desirable uh, forage sources for the uh, beef cattle or horses. So we discounted then the amount of forage that actually was available for livestock. And we calculated there was about 693 kilograms of forage. Now remember we had 2000 kilograms of standing biomass, but it's not all forage. And that would be if on this site, you were just to graze it out, you'd have about 51 days of food using the calculation of 13.6 kilograms per day of food per cow. And that cow is based on about a 440 kilogram weight. So also forage will vary on what we calculate as forage and available food based on class of livestock. Cattle, sheep, goats, horses, camel, all eat slightly different diets. And so when you're calculating a stocking rate, you need to adjust your forage calculation based on the type of livestock animal because they have different eating preferences. And actually they have different heights. A camel being a much taller animal can reach uh, shrubs or trees, uh, whereas a smaller goat would never be able to reach it. So you, you have a height you've got to calculate and then you have the species and its palatability that all gets factored into forage. Resource concerns we saw on the site when we were walking through using indicators of brain sand health, we saw wind erosion. We saw a depletion of organic matter when we dug our soil site. We saw a decreased plant condition, productivity, health, and vigor. Noxious and invasive plants were across the site. Again, we talk about forage quality was decreased. Distribution of livestock water, it appeared to be a central issue here. We could not identify a close source of water, so that meant the animals were having to walk extensive distance. This was actually just a single pasture, and so we're not making reference to the entire ranch at this point. We would have to do this for every pasture on the ranch to get an assessment of productivity and sustainability at the ranch level. So when we get done then, after walking around with our team, uh, we end up with this rating. None to slight, we had four. Slight to moderate, one, two, three, four, five, six different classes uh, were identified. Moderate disruption, five. Moderate to extreme change from the reference area, two and then the EX or extreme departure. Invasive plants, native plant composition and diversity was highly diminished. So now you've got to try, there is no mathematical way of doing this. We don't add it all up and divide. Uh, so it's a qualitative assessment from this point on, on what do you actually call the site? So, we're, we're gonna say that this site is, let me back up. Whoop. Oh, I apologize. We have monitor extreme kind of departure to moderate. So we're right in that area uh, where we are seeing differentiation. It is starting to degrade uh, and we would highly recommend further analysis than to determine the causes and what approaches can be taken then to try and recover the site. So 
Our summary then for this particular pasture then, a plan is needed to probably intercede with crested wheatgrass. Uh, once crested wheatgrass is established, it will compete with uh, the annual weeds, Russian thistle, and reduce their impact. Revegetation in infested areas along with removal of overgrazing is the best way to probably repair this site. We do not anticipate that these invasive plants will just leave on their own if we stop grazing. We have to use uh, human uh, factors and to drive it forward to a desired plant community. Several miles down the highway from this site, we had actually, that's where these pictures are coming from. We saw a wonderful example of revegetation uh, being expressed here with crested wheatgrass uh, with the artemisia in the background, high grazing potential here. So the other thing we want to point out on this site is Russian thistle. Uh, it's a salsola. Uh, it can become toxic. It can accumulate uh, oxalates and also nitrates. Uh, and so for different species of animal during the right time of the year, uh, it actually be can be toxic to the animal and cause weight loss and in severe co consequences actually can cause death. So it's definitely a red flag that that site has serious problems and you need to be very cautious of it. So during droughts uh, and other activities, then that Russian thistle can actually become toxic. The interesting aspect of this plant is, and it's dangerous to do it, but because of its nitrogen load early in the grazing season, uh, it actually can be, it is a lush kind of wet vegetation and can be eaten and livestock can gain weight on it. Uh, but very quickly it can turn toxic. So it's a double-edged sword and I would prefer not to have it on my rangelands at all. So in summary then, you really need that good reference sheet uh, to start with. Then you can go through and qualitative evaluate that site as we just showed in that example. Uh, make inferences then to talk to the ranch manager about things they might wanna change. Uh, and if they're willing to do that, then we'd come back uh, with techniques we'll show next week on how to quantitatively measure to make our recommendations uh, for what is the stocking rate, maybe time of the year, number of animals, distance to water, and a lot of other things to have a sustainable grazing system. So thank you. Uh, this is one of the teams that we worked with uh, in 2019 when we were over there last. So I will stop, I will take any questions. Uh, are there any questions? Mark? Yes, Colnes. Yes, Colnes. Можно перевод? Не слышно. Повторите, пожалуйста, что спрашивает? Спрашивать, если вопросы. Нет, нет, нет вопросов. У, у меня есть вопрос. Можно мне спросить? Uh, please. Uh, вы приводили пример оценки uh, состояния в баллах по шкалам, и там дальше приводили uh, примеры uh, оценки, которые вы проводили вместе вот, с казахстанскими учеными. У меня вопрос, насколько совпадают... Uh, 
показатели американских пастбищ с казахстанскими пастбищами. Там у вас был уклон 5, 5 или 15 процентов, еще, еще какие-то показатели. Вот эти показатели соответствуют ли классам, которыми вы пользуетесь? То есть можно ли разработанной вами матрицей пользоваться в казахстанских условиях полностью? Или эту матрицу надо изменять? A very good question, thank you. No, the uh, approach we use, we have tested it uh, starting back in 2017, uh, 18 and 19, uh, our team was in the country uh, and they absolutely translate and work wonderful in uh, Akmola. Uh, we've actually, earlier than this project we're on right now with ADB, We started in uh, Astana and uh, drove all the way uh, down to Almaty and all over the country. And so we've been in the desert. We've been in the Northeast. Uh, what I haven't seen is the Air All Sea area, but I don't anticipate that's going to have any challenges. These will translate because the recommendation for use is you develop a reference sheet And that reference sheet then is developed right there in Kazakhstan or in Akmola or in any of the other provinces or oblasts. It absolutely translates uh, perfectly. The one major difference we do see is where I live in the United States is what we call basin range topography, a lot of elevational gra gradients. I will have mountains that are uh, four thousand meters high and valley floors that may be only one thousand meters uh, with very steep slopes it was beautiful to see in akmola uh the sh lack of elevation and that kind of flat step region uh beautiful grasslands uh but we measure the reference area slope is zero to one percent not a problem we go right then to the ranch we find that area that's one zero to one percent, an exact match. Hopefully that answers your question. Да, спасибо. Mark, may I uh, ask you one question? Sure, Mira, go ahead. Yeah, thank you for your very good presentation and uh, i would like to ask us you noticed um, and you mentioned that you never been in rlc uh, basin region where the actually the most of the uh, rangeland land is the desert and uh, anyway this area uh, still using for uh, rangeland or like pasture land and uh, if we will use your assessment for this region Uh, is it possible to like renovate this area for for rangeland land, pasture land? And as you know, the environmental for all of the world, like climate change every year, and uh, our region became more hotter. Even we are uh, put their new plantation, the every year the temperature of the weather is uh, became higher and higher can we in uh, for example 10 years uh, some productive areas to produce for using more cattle farm despite the climate change situation yeah i will try and uh restate what i heard and then i will answer it uh And if I get it stated wrong, then, then Mira, please correct me and, and I'll try and answer it again. So there, there's kind of two questions if I understood it right. So I'm familiar from the literature with the Earl C. Basin. It's really contracted. You have new fresh uh, sediment uh, out there, uh, soil surfaces. Uh, a lot of that area is highly saline, highly sodic, uh, very prone to wind erosion. Uh, 
there's almost no slope, so there's not a lot of water erosion. Very harsh environments. There are different uh, programs within Kazakhstan uh, trying to revegetate that uh, so that you can have sustainable livestock production. So that's kind of a background question. Your question, so yes, this approach could be used there. The problem is going to be the challenge any place in the world is what is your reference area? So in the Aral Sea, that's only been in the last 40 years that that land actually became exposed. So what is your reference that you're comparing it to? And, and I don't have an answer, but that's the question to ask. What is your reference you want to measure against? Uh, and it may be a theoretical reference that you define that we can use these plants in an intervention in like a plantation and get them established at a certain density. Uh, maybe two or three uh, plant species would be uh, desirable to start with because they're salinity tolerance. Uh, we may have to do some water harvesting approaches because it's very dry, like what our colleagues in Icarta are doing in the body region in Jordan. They're using a Delfino plow. Uh, now, these areas have slope, uh, maybe 10 to 15 percent slope. And you drag this plow across the hill slopes, you create divots or pits uh, that are scalped out so that water is running downhill, runs into the pit, you trap the water. You then put your shrub or your grass species right into that pit. And then the process accumulates on-site water and you can get very productive sites. Uh, Stefan and uh, Mirahata, uh, colleagues over there, I've seen some wonderful work from them on that. Uh, so they're trying to uh, restore to a, a new reference area. So we'd have to do that down there in that area is to find that reference uh, and then you can measure against it. Are you moving towards it? Or are you moving away from it? Now your context of climate change, that is something we deal with globally. Uh, changes in precipitation, type of pre precipitation, when it occurs, the volume, the intensity that it occurs, along with temperature, vapor, vapor pressure gradient differences or relative humidity. So this approach would still work in that context because you're measuring against a reference. And so that reference area is going to change as climate changes, and it'll be different uh, maybe 15 years from now if unfortunately climate change continues to get hotter and drier, uh, that reference is gonna change. Uh, so you can either measure that reference against a point in time like this year, let's say we made measurements and you would compare that in 15 years, has it changed? And is it due to climate because it's in an ungrazed situation? Uh, so I think it would work either way, Mira, because you're, it's balanced against a reference. And so that's the key is we have to identify that reference and then everything is measured off of it by whatever uh, forces are driving it, whether it's grazing or climate or fire or disease something's going to stress that plant community and move it. So everything's measured against that reference. Did I correctly understand your question? And then secondly, did I correctly answer it for you? Or at least give you information? Okay, thank you very much for the answer. Yes, you correctly understood me. And I hope this assessment will continue for a long time and we will use your assessment tools for the 50 years in Kazakhstan. Well, thank you. But as we get later in our lecture series or our seminar series, training series, uh, at the end, we actually show you uh, how this approach, uh, we have been established this approach in 2003 here in the United States. And so in 2014, we analyzed that first series of data for a national assessment of the United States Western rangelands. Uh, it, that is now going on now. So it's basically uh, almost 20 years of data you're reassessing. So the data actually becomes more and more valuable with time because now we're going to look back and see over this roughly 20 year time period has climate change had an impact on our reference areas. I don't know the answer, uh, 
I'm not part of that research team. Others are. Uh, but that's how we can use this data. So it really becomes valuable the longer the time frame that, that you have and if you've replicated it. Additional questions? All right, well, uh, again, like I said, this is uh, this handbook uh, is available. I'll make sure that Golnez uh, has a copy of it and we can post it to a uh, site that then you can download it for free. Uh, all of the materials that we talk about here were developed in concert uh, in what we call the public domain. So uh, Dr. Chi, myself, our team, uh, our Kazani, Cos now colleagues, uh, all of this stuff is in the public domain. So please copy it, share it, uh, use it. Uh, you if, you have, if you have questions, uh, uh, you can always email me uh, and I'll do my best to answer them. And hopefully the pandemic will allow our team to come and visit you all uh, in November or late October. Uh, we would like to close out this research project with a uh, series of meetings, uh, questions and answers series in November. And we're just praying that uh, the pandemic has lessened and we can actually come in and revisit our friends over there. Спасибо большое, Марк. Меня слышно? Это Гульнас. Yes, go ahead. Хотела сделать пару объявлений участникам. То есть, когда вы заходите в Zoom, обязательно проверяйте при логине, то есть, чтобы у вас было имя и фамилия. Это нам поможет именно при выдаче сертификации. А затем, эта же ссылка будет доступна на следующий семинар. То есть следующий семинар у нас состоится 17 мая, да, среда. Давайте дату проверим. 19 мая будет следующий семинар. По программе вы можете это увидеть. Вот. И сертификаты будут даваться тем, кто прослушал все пять лекций. Спасибо большое. Спасибо, Марк, за такую классную презентацию. Uh, you're welcome. It, it's it's quite an honor uh, to be part of this team. Uh, our partners in Kazakhstan have made us feel welcome, and it's uh, a privilege to work with them. So, as a, as again I said, uh, I work for the U.S. government, and so our information is free. If you have any questions, uh, email me, and I'll get back as soon as possible with you uh, via vis-a-vis -vis email. If we need a personal chat, we can always use Zoom one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. If you have specific questions, and our team will try and do our best to answer them. Uh, and we really appreciate uh, ADB and uh, the Ministry of Agriculture for sponsoring this activity. Uh, I've learned probably more, hopefully, than what I'm presenting to you guys, and I uh, greatly value the opportunity. I have nothing else going as. Uh, so do we uh, conclude today's seminar? Да, на сегодня мы завершаем семинар. Хотелось бы также отметить, вам всем приходили ссылки с моей электронной почты, это gulnas.iskakavasobachka.gmail.com. Если у вас будут вопросы, вы можете прямо писать, кому вы обращаетесь, по какому вопросу. Мы обязательно направим нашим партнерам, вот Марку, доктору Чи, вы с ним еще познакомитесь более подробнее на следующих лекциях. Благодарю за участие. До свидания. Спасибо.